How do you celebrate Valentine's Day? Design and verification? Yeah, me too. <laughs> hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 619 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. Why, yes, we are talking about design and verification this week with Tom Fitzpatrick, General Chair of DVCon 2025. Tom and I explore this year's expo and conference, the motivation behind the creation of the second DVCon keynote, the details of the poster warrior session, and why Tom is especially excited about this year's conference. Also this week, I check out tiny new micro-robots developed by a team of researchers in South Korea that can work together like ants to achieve monumental feats. But first, please welcome Tom back to Fish Fry. Hi, Tom. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, hi, Amelia. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Okay, so DVCon is just around the corner. So, Tom, what does this year's schedule look like? Yeah, you're right. It's coming up really quick, and we're pretty excited about it. We're going to stick with the standard schedule where Monday and Thursday are going to be tutorial and workshop days, and Tuesday and Wednesday will be the technical sessions. Monday is going to be all workshops. They're all 90-minute workshops as opposed to the three-hour tutorials. We've grouped them into topics. So we have a few on UVM and portable stimulus. We have a bunch on artificial intelligence and machine learning. That one's going to start with our workshop from Texas A&M. So the first time we've had them here, kind of an overview of functional verification with machine learning. And then we have a sponsored from companies that are actually going to give concrete examples of how we use that. We have a number of sessions on power everything from UPF to estimating power dynamics and things like that. So that's going to be kind of fun. We actually have, like I said, portable stimulus is you know, near and dear to my heart, of course. So we have a UVM session followed by a couple of portable stimulus on Monday. And then on Thursday, we're only going to be doing it in the morning on Thursday. So we have a tutorial on next-gen verification technologies for, uh, I think it's RISC-V systems. That's going to be from Synopsys. And then we have additional workshops from, from Siemens Real Intent. And then we have a couple of Accelerator workshops on IP Exact and CDC RDC, the, the new interchange format standard from Accelera on Thursday. So those are kind of fun. And again, we're, we're ending before lunch on Thursday, so everybody can blow town on Thursday afternoon if they want. And then Tuesday and Wednesday are going to be a lot of fun. We're starting out with uh, technical sessions on Tuesday. We're going to do the traditional opening session, but nobody comes to that anyway. So we'll jump into things starting at 9. So we have 43 presentation sessions. So everything from low power, again, to functional safety. A couple of sessions on artificial intelligence. We have one on AI and ML in verification, which is tending to be more on LLMs and like code generation kinds of things. And then AI and ML on coverage closure, which is more machine learning for analyzing big data kinds of things. Formal, UVM, verification IP, test bench generation. We also have a analog digital mixed signal session as well. So pretty much anything that you want to learn about doing design and verification, you will find a session for it. Excellent. Now, you guys have two keynotes this year, right? So tell me about that. We do. Yeah, this is kind of exciting. I've always wanted to kind of raise the consciousness, if you will, of everybody there. I want people to understand that what we do can be viewed almost as a service, really. And when I say we, I mean like everybody that's putting chips together, right? They're being done for a reason. And the, in a lot of ways, it's making people's lives better. And I want people to understand more than just how do I get my next chip out the door, right? So we've traditionally had what we're now referring to as the industry keynote. It's kind of rotated between the big three, you know, Siemens, Synopsys, and Cadence. This year, it's Synopsys' turn. But we started a couple of years ago, when, um, it was Siemens' turn. We actually got the Siemens CTO, not the Siemens EDA guy, but the head of, of Siemens overall. And he gave a really nice keynote, I thought not just because I work for Siemens, but I thought it was really good to kind of show how EDA really fits into this larger picture of things that are going on in the world, everything from sustainability to security, all sorts of things. 
So this year for the industry keynote, Synopsys is going to be partnering with Microsoft. So I've asked the industry sponsors to bring in a customer to sort of help provide that additional context, really. So we have Ravi Subramanian from Synopsys, who I get to know fairly well when he was at Siemens. He's a really great speaker. And Arthur Levin from Microsoft. So he's a VP of AI Silicon Engineering. So they're going to be talking about the title is AI Factories Drive Reinvention of Chip Design, Verification, and Optimization. Kind of a, a little bit of, I don't want to say circular reasoning, but uh, you know, AI designs are becoming really the hot thing. And you sort of need AI in order to do AI design and verification. So they're going to talk about how to square that circle, if you will. And that should be really interesting. The thing I really like about bringing in the customers is that it becomes more than just a, you know, here's a commercial for our next release kind of stuff, which is sort of how the, the industry keynotes had gotten over the years. And so I was trying to get away from that. And so it worked really well last year. And I'm sure that, that Ravi and Ardor will do a really nice job with that. And then on Wednesday, we have what we're now referring to as the invited keynote. So last year, we actually had Alex Starr from AMD did it, and he did a really interesting take on EDA and F1 racing. So that was kind of interesting. And this year, we have uh, Rob Aiken from the CHIPS R&D office. And Rob is actually a longtime EDA citizen, I guess. So he, he was at Synopsys for a long time. He's actually on the DAC committee. I believe he was DAC general chair for a year. And so he's, he really knows EDA fairly well. And he's going to be talking about the role of EDA in U.S. economic security. So this was kind of a big thing for why the CHIPS Act was founded. And he's going to give a really nice overview of sort of why EDA is important to the U.S. economy in terms of everything from you know economic security to national security in a lot of ways as well, even though we will have an international audience there. But I think understanding how EDA can be used to do more than just, like I said, get the chip out the door, I think is going to be interesting. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Rob on that. And it'll be good to see him again, too. He's a nice guy. Now, are you seeing any particular themes throughout the technical program? If I had to pick one, it would have to be AI and ML, right? I mean, you know, that we have a panel on Wednesday morning on our AI chips harder to verify. So this will kind of be building a little bit on some of the keynotes stuff and just sort of understanding with all these really huge designs and all of the data that has to be run through them and how you're going to figure that all out, right? You know, how are we going to really verify these things? So like I said, we have a couple of sessions on those, both the AI part and the ML part. The interesting thing for me is when you talk about ML, right? Everybody always thinks that, you know, artificial intelligence is going to be great and it can do everything, but ML, the M in, in ML stands for machine, right? And so that means there's hardware underneath it. So we have to not forget about that. And so I think there's going to be a, a focus on making sure that the hardware can keep up with the demands of what we're expecting AI to be able to do over the coming years. And so that's going to be really interesting. You know, there's always going to be, you know, there's UVM and, uh, you know, as I said, portable stimulus is a particular passion of mine. But if I had to pick one, I'd say, you know, probably AIML is picking up. Even though we have two sessions specifically on that, there are a number of papers in the other sessions that actually refer to those, like using LLMs for generating code for your test bench and things like that. So yeah, that's got to be the biggest one, I think, which is not surprising, really. All right. So, Tom, you've been to quite a few DBCon conferences. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you excited about this year? Wow. Well, the exciting thing for me is always just reacquainting with old friends. You know, I mean, there are people that I see once a year, maybe twice a year, if you can count DAC, but I've seen them for 25 years and they've become friends. And I enjoy that part of it for me personally, but I also like seeing that happen for others as well. You know, when I see a, a young engineer showing up, maybe presenting a paper for the first time, you know, that's a, a really great thing to see and to see them start networking and, you know, recognizing myself from, <laughs> from way back then, you know. The other thing that's always fun, we started doing this a few years ago, is the poster warrior session. One of the things that has really bothered me over the years is this perception that the posters at DBCon are sort of second-class citizens, and that's not the case at all. It's another format for presenting your work to the audience. A lot of people actually prefer posters because of the interaction that you can have with the people that come up and talk to you about your poster. So the awards are the same for posters and presentations. You know, you get the same amount of money, you get the same recognition. But what we started doing a couple of years ago is this poster Ninja Warrior session where the top four posters, as rated by people from the Tuesday poster session, which is two hours, will actually do a five-minute presentation each on their posters. This year, we've rearranged the schedule, so it's going to happen right after the keynote on Wednesday. So everybody that comes to the conference, and even people 
uh, I think we're going to open it up to the public, actually. So we haven't made a final decision on that. But basically, everybody that's registered for the conference will be in this session. It'll be a big room. Last couple of years, we've fitted into one room, and it was kind of crowded. So this will be in the big keynote room. And the four poster authors will do a five-minute presentation on each of the posters. And we have a panel of experts who will ask a few questions from them, and there'll be questions from the audience. And then the judges will vote right there on the top three, and those will get the best poster, first place, second place, third place awards later that evening, along with the best presentations. And another thing that I'm really excited about, I can't tell you much, but I can tell you that we're going to have a major announcement about future DV cons that's going to be coming at the Wednesday lunch. So kind of excited about that. Excellent. Well, Tom, I think that's all I have time for. But before I let you go, it's time for your off the cuff. So, <laughs> Tom, if you could have one meal with one person, alive or dead, right now, who would it be? I would have to go with bread and wine with Jesus. I mean, that is a great answer. Okay. Can't do much better than that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Well, Tom, I think that is all the time I have today. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you. All right. Do you want to re-record anything before I hit that? Uh, no, but I do have one uh, one little teaser that I wanted to include. Um, oh, yeah. Go ahead. So, um, so if you can add this to the end of the, you know, what are you excited about thing? Oh, for right? sure. Yeah, okay. And another thing that I'm really excited about, I can't tell you much, but I can tell you that we're going to have a major announcement about future DV cons that's going to be coming at the Wednesday lunch. So uh, kind of excited about that. Excellent. All right. We will patch that in. Great. And put it at the end. You know what else I love? Robots. I know you do, too. So have you heard that scientists in South Korea have developed swarms of mini magnetic robots that can work together? Yeah, so akin to ants, these little guys can achieve monumental feats, including picking up objects hundreds of times their size. And they are all controlled by a rotating magnetic field. So, what makes these micro-robots different from other robotic swarms? Well, they're cube-shaped. Yep, cubes. So, previous robotic swarm research has concentrated mostly on spherical robots, which come together through point-to-point -point contact. But this team made their micro-robots cube-shaped to increase their magnetic attraction with a larger surface area. Basically, each side of the cube can come into contact with another micro-robot. So, how micro are we talking about here? Well, these little guys are pretty darn small. Each one is around 600 micrometers tall and consists of an epoxy body embedded with particles of ferromagnetic neodymium iron boron, which enables it to respond to magnetic fields and interact with other micro-robots. By powering the robots with a magnetic field generated by rotating two connected magnets, the swarm of micro-robots can self-assemble. This team was also able to program the robots to come together in a variety of different configurations, all based on changing the angle at which the robots were magnetized. So what these little guys can do is incredibly cool. So first, this team of researchers from Organic and Nano Engineering at Hanyang University in Seoul, South Korea, wanted to see how different configurations of these swarms of micro-robots could perform different tasks. They found that swarms with high aspect ratio assembly could climb an obstacle five times higher than the body length of one single micro-robot and could also hurl themselves one by one over an obstacle. They also discovered that a large swarm of a thousand micro-robots with high packing density could also build a raft that floated on water. 
They could also wrap themselves around a pill that weighed 2,000 times more than each individual robot and move that pill through liquid. Oh, there's more. <laughs> On dry land, a robot swarm managed to transport cargo 350 times heavier than each individual robot. And yet another micro-robot swarm from this team was able to unclog tubes that resembled blocked blood vessels. And not only all of that, this team was also able to develop a system where these robots could guide the motion of small organisms through spinning and orbital dragging. Wow. So, are swarms of micro-robots coming to a doctor's office near you anytime soon? No. <laughs> but the potential for these little guys is incredible. Zhang Zhe-Wei of the Department of Organic and Nanoengineering at Hanyang University in Seoul outlines where this research is headed in the future. He says, while the study's results are promising, the swarms will need higher levels of autonomy before they will be ready for real-world applications. The magnetic robot swarms require external magnetic control and the lack of ability to autonomously navigate complex or confined spaces like real arteries. Future research will focus on enhancing the autonomy level of the microbot swarms, such as real-time feedback control of their motions and trajectories. Super cool. So if you guys want even more information about this study or more information about this year's DVCon taking place February 24th through the 27th at the Doubletree by Hilton in San Jose, California, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series and our animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, -E at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of February 14th, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.